Hi, it's Ed Butowski. So recently we launched the AI strategies from Chapwood. And this is a very, very unique uh, way of approaching investment management. And we're doing it with a gentleman named Dr. Tal Schwartz. And Tal is a brilliant, brilliant person who got his PhD from Cornell in finance and worked at Citadel. So for those of you who don't know, Citadel is one of the top quant hedge funds in the world. And he worked as a quant researcher there and also worked at Mesero. So as AI becomes more and more a part of our lives, we thought it was really important to dive into it with these strategies. So we did a podcast with him and that's what follows here. And it's a little long, but I want you to take the time to listen and really understand what it is that Tal and I are discussing. Vesting is a game of inches and we believe that we have a couple of I guess additional inches here, uh, something you can't get anywhere else. And we really want you to take a look at this and consider it uh, for part of your portfolio. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this very special Making Sense. Uh, today, we have a recurring guest, Tal Schwartz, or Dr. Tal Schwartz, I should say. And uh, one of the reasons that we're doing this is that the last time I had him on, uh, we talked about AI and producing funds with AI. So I went ahead and developed a relationship where we're going to be working together and doing strategies with AI. They're going to be called CHAP AI Strategies. And uh, so, Dr. Schwartz, thanks for joining me again. I can't hear you. I said, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So, um, so for those of you joining, um, we're going to be going through a PowerPoint presentation and going through exactly how the strategies are set up. So if you feel like this is more of a sales vehicle, it is uh, promoting uh, the strategies that we're going to be doing here at Chapwood uh, with AI. But you've all heard about AI. It, you know, you can't go anywhere these days without hearing about it. And Dr. Schwartz is one of the foremost experts in the field of AI uh, generated investments. And um, hopefully he's going to take us through quite a bit that's going to be really eye-opening to all of us today. So, uh, Dr. Schwartz, thank you again. And uh, why don't you take it away? Excellent. Well, thank you, Ed, for having me. I will share my screen now, and hopefully you can see it. Can you see my screen? Let me know. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Excellent. So, I have a few presentation slides here, the usual disclaimers. And then the agenda for today, we'll do an intro to AI funds. Uh, we'll talk about, that's the company I founded. Uh, we'll talk about the current investment practices, what usually is done. We'll talk about Bela, which is our AI investment system. And then we'll talk about specific uh, strategies that we developed for Chapwood. We call them Chap AI. We'll talk about the strategies, how they're built, and then also the performance, the backtest performance. And we'll conclude. And at the end, we have some Q&A. So we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. Sounds great. Okay. In terms of why we started this, really, we started this before all the big hoopla around ChatGPT. And that's because we recognize that AI machine learning is really able to excel in a bunch of different areas already back in 2019. And since then, it's advanced in many more. But what we've noticed is that in, for example, playing games, um, machine learning and AI has been superior to pretty much humans uh, in pretty much every game out there. And it started with Kasparov losing to Deep Blue back in 1997. And it continued with uh, IBM Watson winning Jeopardy. And then uh, in 2016, uh, AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl, who was the world champion in Go. And we didn't think this would happen for many more years. And quickly after that, in 2017, uh, we had a poker uh, AI that beat the world's best poker players. And that continued through online games and many other games. So pretty much AI is the best in the world in games. And the, the question that we thought of was, well, can if it's so good at playing games, can it be good in other things? And we know today that that's true. It's, it's getting good in many things, better than most humans in many things, but specifically in investment. Can it do better than the best humans in investing and managing money? And that's really what we started investigating. And what we found is, well, I'll show you what we found, but just a little bit about my background, why, uh, I, I, I'm, how long I've been doing this and, and, and what exactly. So... Half of my career has been as an academic researcher. Uh, I got my PhD in finance from Cornell. 
I taught finance at Nepal and a few other universities around the world. Um, I also worked as a data scientist and AI expert in a few different financial organizations. I worked in Bezerra Financial, um, the Citadel, it's a large hedge fund. I worked as a quant, uh, that's sort of stands for quantitative researcher. And then I have my own company called Clickta, where we use a lot of machine learning and AI in a different domain. And then I combine all this knowledge to really start AI funds. Now, let's talk a little bit about how people manage money today or typically. So you have something called human active management, where basically a person decides what to invest in. And what we've seen over time is that most of the human managed investments underperform the market. Something like 85% of active large cap funds under, underperformed the S&P 500, which is their benchmark. And the reason, there's a few different reasons. A lot of it has to do with human biases, um, uh, things like uh, the, the things that Kahneman, Tversky, and Thaler have written about and won the prizes for. And there's also a lot of data. Data grows exponentially, has been growing exponentially. And also transaction costs. So in the end, you end up underperforming the benchmark. So what most investors have been gravitating to, to over time is passive investment. And the idea there is you look at the historical returns and correlations between different asset classes, and you build a portfolio that's the most efficient, that's along the efficient frontier. And this is a concept that was written by Markowitz, who won a Nobel Prize for this. And the idea is once you know what your risk aversion is, you pick a point along the frontier and you stick to that point unless your risk aversion changes. But it, generally, you stick to that, and you might rebalance once a year, but you don't really change it very much. So it's a fairly static portfolio. And in the long run, that, that does OK. But there's a problem with this. And the problem is that you assume that the past is going to be the same in the future. So the future is going to equal the past. And that's not the case. Things change all the time. So sometimes, and what you see here is every year, a different asset class outperforms. Sometimes it's large cap, sometimes it's small cap. Sometimes it's value and it changes year to year. So on average, you do okay with the strategy, but not, not really great, you do okay. And what we're proposing with AFS is really changing the paradigm. So if the current paradigm, you can think of it as a static one period game, and the word game here is the idea from game theory, um, then the, and the average returns equals past returns and past correlations, and you pick a point along that efficient frontier, then the new game, the new way to invest is really a dynamic multi-period game where AI is finding patterns. And really, it's more like a game of chess, where you have a chessboard, the economy is the chessboard, and you're figuring out where you want to put your pieces, meaning where do you want to invest, what sectors, how aggressive do you want to be? And it changes. It's like um, it, it, it's much more complicated, um, but it's something that AI can do very well, as we saw from, from playing games. So that's the, that's the idea. How do we implement it specifically at AI funds? So we have our system, it's called Vela. Vela stands for Bayesian AI Learning Algorithm. And it does two things. It performs a function of a macro strategist and a portfolio manager, okay? And let me explain that. So as a macro strategist, what it's trying to do is figure out what kind of environment are we in right now? Are we in a bull market or a bear market? And the way it does that, it looks at a bunch of different macroeconomic variables and looks at the recent patterns and then, then it does pattern matching. This is something AI is very good at. It basically looks through time and says, when is the most similar time to today? Now, there's never been a time like today. Um, AI, uh, it, the world all the time is changing. But there are times in the past which were most similar. And it finds this economic fingerprint, takes the current economic fingerprints and finds the closest ones in the past. And then once it finds those, it looks into the future to see what did the market do. Times that were like today, did the market go up? Did it go down? Did it go sideways? Based on that, it builds a distribution and then makes a, uh, an estimate about whether the market is more likely to go higher or go lower or go sideways. And then it positions itself based on that, um, that posture. Okay, So that's the macro strategy part. The portfolio optimizer part is really taking the universe of ETFs that we're working with and figuring out the best set of ETFs that will do well in that type of environment. So if we're in a bullish market, we're going to be a little more aggressive. If we're in a bearish market, we're going to be more defensive. That's basically the idea. So we have so these are the three steps in the um, in Bela's algorithm, and um, and we can actually that's a high overview of how it works. And Tal, so we're going to jump. Yes, Tal, what is Bayesian? 
Stanton mean? Oh, okay. Bayesian is based on a, on a famous mathematician named uh, Bayes. And what Bayes discovered, this I think is in the 1700s, is that you can use information to update your priors. Okay, it gets a little complicated, but the idea is that you basically can um, get a better estimate on what is uh, the probability of something occurring based on new information. And there's a mathematical formula for doing that that's underlying many things that we do in machine learning and AI. So the idea is as the AI is learning information, it's able to update its priors, update its estimates of where the market is going and what are the best ETF to own in that type of environment. So that's the idea behind the word Beijing. And, and you, you crafted all of this. This is not something that you bought from somebody. You programmed this whole thing. That's right. That's right. So I built this. Um, we now have, it's not just me, it's, we have a team now, but the idea is that we built this really to, uh, um, specifically for you, Ed, uh, we have some underlying technology and then specifically for Chapwood, we have these strategies that are custom made for you. Great. Okay. So let's talk about that. We call it Chap AI, as I mentioned before, and this is a simulation that assumes no transaction costs, and no management fees. So that's important to understand. So I'm showing you a back test here. And the way we built the strategies, and this is, gets a little technical, but uh, stay with me and let me know if you have questions. So the objective here is to maximize return per unit risk, okay? It's a concept we have in finance, we have a, a, something called sharp ratio. And that there it's basically return divided by standard deviation. And the idea is that we're trying to maximize how much return we get and try to minimize the amount of risk we have. And that's why the risk is in, in the denominator. So the smaller the risk, the higher the ratio. Okay, so that's the higher, that's uh, the objective. What is the universe of ETFs that we optimize on? We have, an e we have 90 ETFs. These are all liquid ETFs, all have AUM of at least $500 million, and many have multi-billion dollar AUMs. So these are large, very liquid ETFs, and we'll go over the list, we'll show that to you. And we have five different strategies. Each strategy is actually targeted for a specific volatility area. And what, what does it mean volatility? It's how... Uh, you can think of it as, oh, you know, the idea of volatility is how much things move up and down. The volatility targets are percentages of the volatility of the S&P 500. So the idea is that if you're at CHAP AI 40, you're going to be exposed to roughly 40% of the volatility of the S&P 500. Okay? In the long run, that's the volatility targeted. And if you're at CHAP AI 80, that's 80% 80 of the volatility of the S&P 500. Okay? So that's the idea. So we have these CHAP AI strategies between 40 and 80. Uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. The portfolios typically hold something like six to seven ETFs. The smallest portfolio would be five ETFs. So the maximum weight per ETF would be 20%. The minimum is 2%. Now, the way these rebalance, these are active strategies. So they rebalance on Mondays if there's a market state change. The market state, remember what I mentioned earlier, there's this Bayesian prediction of where the market is going to go. So if the market is bullish, then, it, then the portfolio stays there. Unless four weeks have passed. If four weeks have passed, then we rebalance it because there's some new patterns and the AI can learn from the new patterns and possibly improve the portfolio. So that's the idea. The idea is we have this, um, this portfolio that gets rebalanced. Now, what is the universe of 90 ETFs? We won't go through all of them. Obviously, there's 90 of them. That's quite a few. But essentially, we cover, if you can see here, in the first column at the top, we cover all the, um, the, the sectors of the S&P 500. We have those. We have very large um, you know, general indices like the S&P 500, we have the you know, large cap, mid cap, small caps. We have some of the um, uh, factors like quality, minimum vol, equal weight, and so on. We have some of the, uh, um, some specific more industries. And then we have uh, a lot of uh, fixed income as well. Um, different parts of the term structure, as well as corporate uh, fixed income, um, so we have we have a whole range of different levels of risk, and we have some very short fixed income. These are like very short, like cash-like ETFs. So the AI can choose from this whole universe of nine ETFs to figure out how to build the best portfolio. Okay. Now let me, I'm going to start showing you some results. The first graph I'm showing here, this is called a mean variance graph, and the reason we call it that is because on the x-axis we have something called standard deviation, which is like volatility measure. Okay. And then the Y, we have annual returns. Now, this is a back test that ran between January 2005 to January 2024. So that's a 19-year back test. 
And what you see here in the red dot in the bottom right, that's the S&P 500, okay? So it had a volatility or a standard deviation of roughly 15% and a return of roughly 9.6%, okay? That's over these 19-year these, um, period. And you see what the different CHAP AI strategies did over the same time. And what you can see is the CHAP AI 40 Tal. When you divide the return by the standard deviation to get the shark. And as you go to the right, you can see that those sharp ratios are very high. And um, and you go to the right all the way to chap 60, for example, that had 16.4% and a standard deviation of 9%. So still uh, a sharp ratio that's about 122. And as you go all the way to the right to chap uh, AI, 80, you have a sharp ratio of 1.7, so slightly less sharp, sharp ratio. The return is about 20.6% per year and a volatility of 12%. So you're still about 80% of the volatility of the S&P, but significantly higher return, okay? So the idea is as long as you go to the left, upper left, you're getting less risk and higher return. And again, this is a back test without transaction costs or um, or management fees. So the um, actual result will not be, clearly won't be as good as this. Um, so that's a high level. Now to see this as a cumulative graph, here we graph the cumulative performance starting in um, basically December 31, 2004, all the way to January 19th, 2024. And what you can see here is the cumulative gain, the annual return, and the uh, correlation with the S&P. So the correlation is not 100% because you have a different uh, level of uh, like ET different ETFs and different level of risk exposure. And also the beta is much lower than one. So beta of one means you're very, you have a beta of the S&P 500. And as you can see, the CHAP AI 80 has a beta of 0.54, meaning it's about half the beta of the S&P, 74% correlation. And it has, and what you look at when you see these graphs, what you'll notice is the red graph is the S&P 500, the green is the CHAP AI 40, and they're all lined up the way you'd expect them to. You have the 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. Um, and uh, you can see that the volatility, as you go to the higher risk, they're more volatile, okay? Another way we like to look at these graphs is by doing something called the log returns. And the reason we do log returns is because when you have the graphs this way, the cumulative returns, it's hard to see what happened earlier years because the recent years, the values are so high, they kind of swamped the earlier years. But in a log scale, so the left now is log cumulative returns, what you can see, you can see a lot more of the patterns. And what you can see is that there was a lot of volatility around 2008. If you recall, there was a big market draft, right? The great, we had a, a, a big uh, market uh, uh, correction then. And you can see the other corrections, but it's still hard to see exactly the corrections and how the different strategies did. So what we do is a different type of graph, and this is uh, the drawdown graph. So here what we're showing over the same time scale, but now we're showing the drawdown of every strategy. And the idea for the drawdown is you're looking at the, how far down, the, um, uh, you look at the, the most recent high and how far down the cumulative return went down. So the red line is the S&P 500. And what you'll see is we have the max DD, the max drawdown here, and it was 55.2% for the S&P 500, that was back in 2008. And you can see all the different drawdowns that happened. And at the same time, we have all the other strategies, the CHAP AI strategies here. And what you'll notice is the CHAP AI strategies have much lower drawdowns, anywhere from 12% to 28%. So CHAP AI 80 had a, a max drawdown of 28.5%, and that was back in 2008. Um, but so that's one way to look at it is maximum drawdown. And that's typically what most, what you normally see. We use some additional statistics for risk. Um, one I really like is called the ulcer index. And the idea behind that is that you don't look just at the max drawdown, but you try to look at all the drawdowns together. So the idea is to add them all up and do like a standard deviation type calculation. And when you do that, you get a much more holistic view of how all the drawdowns affected the strategy. And in this case, what you see is the S&P 500 had a ulcer index of 13.1%, but the CHAP AI strategies had much lower drawdowns. 
uh, also in this. So uh, anywhere from 1.8 to 3.7%. So significantly lower drawdown over the whole history of the back test. So Tal- And if you look at the ulcer, yeah. Tal, you know I love the ulcer index. Um, what What is a good ulcer index number? Um, it, it, well, what's a good number? I think, uh, anything below 5%, I would say is a very good number, uh, because you're getting, uh, strategies that are, that are very good. Um, it's not that anything between five and, uh, 10 is not good. That's, that's a lot of strategies are between five and 10. It's just that if you want to be more conservative, you want to get a number that's below five. Um, the S&P 500 is 13 and a lot of people own the S&P 500 in their portfolios as a passive strategy. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, but it's uh, it, it should be a piece of your strategy, a piece of what you're doing, not everything. Because for most people, that's too much volatility. Imagine 2008 and having seeing your investments fall by 55%. That's hard for most people to, to absorb. So um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a good rule of thumb, 5% or lower. Um, the other measure we use is something called the also performance index, and there the idea is to use the return divided by the risk measure, in this case, also the also index, and you can see what the ratio is. So the also performance index for the S&P 500 is 0.74, and these strategies are significantly higher. You can see the, the highest ones are CHAP 50 or CHAP 60, and, and the other ones are also very high. So you, you, you get a significantly much better risk, sorry, return to risk profile compared to the traditional passive index. Okay. Um, to get a sense of what the portfolio is holding, I took all the holdings that were the most recent rebalance. This is back in January 8th. And you can see what the holdings were and what the percentages are. And the one thing I wanted you to notice is that as you go to the right, the risk profile changes for each strategy, right? So when you're chapter I-40, you hold a lot more fixed income and actually short-term debt. So you have the OEF Twenty uh, percent. So OEF is the NAS is the S and P one hundred. So the one hundred largest companies. And then you have JPST, USFR, and T flow. Those are all uh, short term um, U.S. Treasuries, and XLV, healthcare, XLK, technology, XLF, financial. So about sixty percent of that portfolio is fixed income, and that's roughly what you'd expect given that this is a Chapter I forty. All right. Um, as you move to the right, you can see how the mix changes. So Chapter I sixty has a lot more equity exposure. It still has some fixed income, has T-flow at 20% and some other, uh, and, and J, JPST, but it has some other uh, exposure. It's not all into high tech. It has some IV, it has some a QQQ, but an, an XLK, but it also has VIG, which are dividend growers. So it has the right mix so that on average, its risk exposure is roughly 60% that the volatility of the S&P. And as you go all the way to the right, and now you have the CHAP AI 80, that is much more risky, clearly. It has XLK and IVE and OEF and XLV. So a lot less uh, fixed income still has some assets that are less volatile than the S&P, but it has some that are more volatile. And that mixed together makes this portfolio riskier. So the AI is actually picking from those 90 ETFs for each one of the strategy and picking the optimal combination of assets of ETFs and the weights to give it the right exposure to do well in the current environment. And as you can guess, right now, since January 8th, we've been in an upmarket state. We've actually been in that state for a while now. And the idea is that, that, that we had a recent high last Friday. The AI is saying that's likely to continue. Okay, So it, right now is a good time to be in the market. Um, to get a better sense of how the strategy has done over the last three years, what we've done is we plotted the performance since January 1st, 2020, over the last um, uh, three years to really, sorry, four years to get a sense of really what's been happening. And um, uh, what you see here is when you see a horizontal line, that means it's that the AI basically was out of the market. It, it went into these risk-free assets, these cat-like investments or, or nearly, ne nearly risk-free, uh, essentially basically saying, I don't want to take any risk. And it's done that a few times. So if you look carefully, you see it was risk off here at the beginning of 2020. So this is right before the time of COVID. Then it was risk-free right here around, um, uh, again, October of 2020, and again here, and later on here. And most recently, it was it was risk off, I think, around the September, October timeframe of 2023. Now, it doesn't always get it perfectly right, but it avoids some drawdowns. 
Uh, sometimes it misses some of the up movements, but usually it reduces the volatility significantly by doing that and still maintains a lot of the upside momentum. And it doesn't get it perfect. Like for example, here you could see that it went risk into the market back in over here and actually caught a piece of the downturn most recently, but then the market went back up. So it's not perfect, but it's better than being all in the market all the time because it lets you come in and out of the right timing and gives you the right set of ETFs to own in those environments. So in the last uh, four years of doing this, you can see what the gain has been anywhere from 69% to 218% for the chapter I-80, that's compared to 60% for the S&P 500. The annual, the annual return is here, so anywhere between 13 to 33%. And the standard deviation has been significantly lower than the S&P, between 6 and 15%. So you, the sharp ratios are ridiculously high, it's above two. Um, we've had a specific environment, this AI did really well in it. There's no guarantee that we'll continue doing this, but this was very impressive for us. So uh, three and two years. Tao, can you touch on how you did the back testing? I know it gets very complicated and I don't want to lose yeah. everybody, but I think some people might be asking, okay, well, how, how is this back testing done and how realistic is it? Okay, good, good question. So what we do is we take something like 50 or 60 years worth of historical data. Um, and this data includes, of course, stock prices and different types of indices, as well as some macro data. And the idea being, we let the AI learn over the next the first um, 40 years, 30, 40 years of data. We let it learn different relationships in the data and really understand what is um, what does it mean when one thing moves or the other moves. And basically, these relationships are the underlying um, learning of what the AI does, it figures out really what affects what, and, and, and specifically, what are the types of um, patterns that precede high market volatility or a chance, a higher chance that the market will, will fall. And uh, that's what it does up until about 19 years ago. And then we start letting it actually trade the different ETFs. And uh, one thing I should mention, the ETFs have to have at least four years worth of data because we need to have enough patterns in the data to be able to do that portfolio optimization piece. Um, so that's why if it's an ETF that just came out to the market, you know, in this case, we set what the universe is 90, but in general, um, we need to have enough data so that AI can actually be able to look at the patterns and figure out how to put things together in a smart way. Um, and then we let it go. We start, we, we start running it. And it's rebalancing basically, as I mentioned, every week. Um, and it rebalances if it gets a signal that either the prediction for what's going to happen has changed or four weeks have passed. So that's essentially what it does over time. And it keeps learning. That's what, that's the Bayesian part of it, right? You asked me the Bayesian. Um, so the Bayesian AI learning algorithm is essentially learns over time. So it gets better over time. So the idea is that as new things happen, it actually learns and gets better. And what you've seen it do here essentially is learn how to time, understand when there's higher risk in the market. So it kind of gets out before um, the market goes down. Uh, it doesn't always get it right. There's actually, you can see periods here where it went out of the market, the market actually ended up going higher, a little bit higher. And so it might have missed a little bit of upside um, and it may not catch all the drops, but it catches enough that it makes a big difference. So, so okay. Tal, we have a question from somebody um, asking about AI only deploys technical and fundamental analysis but does not do any social media sentiment analysis. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And um, what we found is that um, because the holding period here is a, at minimum a week, and typically it's four weeks, um, those type of information is already, already showing up in the actual asset prices. So you, you look at the asset prices and you can see the patterns of whatever is happening in social media. And because our holding period is so long, those type of effects kind of tend to get washed out. So we're really looking at effects that are on the order of weeks to be able to, to do this. Um, and we can't, we don't trade intraday or, you know, <laughs> very short trading horizons of a few days. This, this have to be signals that can be traded on over, over a longer period of time. Okay, now I know you have more slides to get to, but a couple of questions have come in and they're very easy questions, I think, for you to answer. One is from okay. here. He says, how does the strategy adjust for persistent down markets? Good question. Um, so 
uh, I, I actually had a slide, I, I took it out of 2022 when we had this down market. And what you see in 2022 is that the strategy was actually, um, we were out of the market for a big chunk of it. Um, uh, uh, and uh, actually you can see it here. Uh, it, we were out of the market over here. So that was a big part of the year. Um, not the whole year because we also, we were in the market here at this piece. But what you see is that when we're out of the market, basically uh, the AI is basically saying, look, it's too risky, too volatile, let's pull out. Now that doesn't happen very often, I have to say. Uh, you can see the times that we were out of the market. Most of the time the market is going higher, but you do have periods like 2022 when we did have that trend going down and the patterns were such in the different variables that it made sense to be out of the market, okay? Um, so the I, I to be honest, based on what I've seen on, on Wall Street and also my own personal uh, views, I tend to be more wrong than right. Um, and the AI is doing does much better than I do and much better than most of uh, most of the progress procrastinators on Wall Street. Um, so it's uh, I, I I've come to trust it a lot more than I trust myself, to be honest. And because it's hard to get out of the market when you know that the market usually goes higher. Um, and it's hard to go back in, especially after you've had a down year and say, you know what, now it's time to be you know, risk on. Um, like we had as most recently last year when we had this down downward period. So it's it's kind of, and, and this is one of the areas where the AI actually has an advantage over humans. We have a tendency to be myopic, which means we see the most recent history and think that's what's going to continue. So if the market goes down, we have a hard time believing that it will go back up. And same thing, if it goes up, it's, we have a hard time believing it will go down. Um, so that's one bias. And the second bias is that because we're myopic, we, we, and we kind of like go with the herd. So if everybody's bullish, we're bullish. And if everyone's defensive and, and, and very bearish, we tend to be bearish. The AI doesn't have those kinds of biases. So it's able to do a really good uh, probabilistic estimation of what's going to happen in the market. And, and make the right decision based on a little probability of different things that are occurring rather than emotion and what so, someone is saying on TV. So John has a question. He says, what happens when a black swan event occurs? Okay, good question. Um, so a lot of times I have to tell you, this is actually interesting. The black swan event is actually preceded by some patterns. And what's, you can actually see it right here in the data. If you look back in, two, if you think of a black swan, we had one right here in March of 2020 when COVID hit. So we had a black swan here. The AI was out of the market. It missed some of the upside here, but then it also was out most of the downside. So it was able to avoid a lot of that. Now, why, why what was it seeing? It was seeing patterns in the data that indicated, you know, something's going on. It didn't know about COVID. It didn't see it. It didn't know that that was happening, but it saw something in the price movements and some other macro variables that indicated that, you know what, something strange is happening. It's better to be out of the market or mostly out of the market. Take risk off the table. It turned out to be correct, but this is, this is the kind of thing that it's not going to catch every black swan, but this is the kind of thing you hope it does because a lot of times there are patterns that tend to repeat every time there is this type of black swan. And it turns out that a lot of the patterns that we had before COVID, if you look carefully, you can actually see some of the same patterns back in 2008 before the market dropped back then. And it's like these warning signals that appear and uh, it's hard for us humans to see them, um, but the AI is seeing the patterns and it's saying, you know, I've seen this before. There's a high probability the market will drop 5% or 10% or whatever it is. It's better to take risk off the table right now. So uh, it's, it's, I can tell you, so those kind of things happen. Now, it doesn't know if it's going to be a black swan event or just a small you know, 5 or 10% correction. But when it sees that risk, it, it, it wants to, um, you know, it basically tells us, hey, now it's a time to be a little more defensive because we have that risk on the table right now. Does the size of the portfolio impact the numbers at all? When you say the size, you mean the number of ETFs or... Well, I would say or that the size AUM or the AUM, the AUM. Okay, so the ETFs we invest in, as I showed you before, are all very large ones. So uh, most of them are multi-billion uh, ETFs in AUM. So the size of the portfolio should not impact uh, in any way the 
you know, the trading of, of those ETFs. We especially, we picked ones that were very liquid, that have very narrow bid ask spread, spread so that there is um, going to be minimal effect on trading costs. So the, the size of the portfolio should not impact. And look, you know, it's only when this strategy gets to be a billion dollar or a few billion dollars in size, that's when potentially you can think that it could have an impact. Uh, but so we're, we're far away from that. And I don't expect that to be any kind of, uh, any kind of impact. Okay. Should I continue? Or are there more questions? Yes. Yeah, well, there was one more okay. that said, did you see any anomalies before January 15th, 2023? Well, I I personally didn't see it. The AI sees it, um, uh, and I I have to check exactly when it went risk off. Um, but it I know that there was a big chunk that you can actually see it here in the graph when the market um, it actually went risk off before the market peak, and then stayed off before the market bottom. So it was it was out of the market during this period, or mostly out of the market. And so there was some, um, sorry, this is not in January, January, somewhere over here. So no, you can see that we were in the market throughout January. And when we went out of the market, this was around, I think, September timeframe. So no, we, we the AI did not see. And uh, as you can see, it was the market was in general volatile, but trending higher during this time. So it didn't see that. It saw the potential risk only later in the year. Uh, around September, October time frame. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll let you continue. All right. All right. So what I wanted to actually show here is what the holdings were as an example for CHAP AI 80. And the reason I'm showing this, I want to show how the model actually changes over time. So when we started back in June 30th here, 2023, I'm showing it, it actually started much earlier, but showing it from here, we were risk on. Okay. Then we had a rebalance because four weeks have passed. And we were risk on again um, through early July. And you can see what the holdings were. And then right around the middle of July of 2023, so here uh, I, you can see it went risk off. So actually the risk off that I talked, spoke about before actually happened around the middle of, of, um, of July, July 21st. It rebalanced, went risk off. So you see all these ETFs, these are all uh, short-term treasuries, very low risk assets. Uh, treasury bills and, and floating rate notes and things of that nature. And it held them for four weeks. Then it rebalanced. We're still risk off. So held very similar, actually, to same ETFs. Probably the weights might have changed a bit between this rebalance. Again, four weeks passed, still risk off. So again, holdings, very similar ETFs. After four weeks, again, it had a rebalance. But this time, it just happens that the exact rebalance of the four weeks happened with the signal that we're going risk on. So right around October 13th, the strategy went risk on, and you can see what CHAP AI 80 was holding. So it was holding very risky ETFs, XLK, IVE, XLV, QQQ, and so on. So it went risk on, and it kept holding that uh, pretty much very similar portfolio after four weeks rebalanced, similar ETFs, slightly different weights. Again, rebalanced after four weeks, similar ETFs, not exactly, you can see, the order here means what the weightings is. So some of the weightings changed. And again, and here it went down to a portfolio of six ETFs. You can see that right here in December. And now it rebalanced again on, uh, this is Friday, uh, January 5th. And it's been the same portfolio since of the last three rebalances. Our next rebalance will be this uh, next Monday. It's coming Monday. So, and this is what the current portfolio is. So you can see how that's changed and evolved over time. So in terms of question, uh, the question, when were we risk on? We off, we were risk off between July 21st through, uh, you could say October 13th, and the rest of the time we were risk on. And if you look again in that graph, you can see that here. So uh, the second half of October, the market was still trending down. So we ended up losing money during that period, but then we've made it all up and much more over the last um, uh, weeks, few weeks since then. So, um, so that's really, so you can see this period of risk off right here um, in this table right here, okay? So it gives you a sense of how this works. Now, if the, um, um, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if the signal changes, for example, this coming Monday, Bela might say, you know what? We've gone up a lot. Um, I'm seeing patterns that we should take risk off the table. We could go defensive again. I have no way of knowing that right now. Um, until I run Bela, we won't know that. 
Um, but basically, as of now, we're risk on, and that's the posture we're in. Typically, when we're risk on, as you saw before, we tend to stay risk on for a while. You can see that period. But then once in a while, if, if, if the patterns are right, then we might take risk off the table and, and, and say, hey, it's time to actually um, you know, uh, keep our gains and, and, and ride out the coming volatility that's come. So that's, that's essentially how it works. Um, I've also included here the annual, specifically annual returns for the different strategies and the average annual return uh, in the ballot, in, in, on the bottom row here. So we, we actually averaged um, the returns across these different, um, across the different years. And um, what you'll see, this is similar to the, what I showed before, but here it's the annual average. And you can see that most years, uh, the strategies do very well compared to the S&P 500. Here is the SPY ETF, which tracks the S&P 500. Um, in some years, incredibly well. So 2008, we're able to avoid a lot of the drawdown and actually had an up year. Same thing is true in 2018, as well as 2022. But some years, we're actually behind the benchmark. Um, let's see, 2019, the benchmark did very well, up 31%. We were up, just not as much as the benchmark. So it works most years very well. And the most important thing is that the reason it does overall like very well is because it, it's able to avoid some of those drawdowns. That's the, you know, it, it can take um, uh, the, the risk off posture. That, that's what gives it really the biggest advantage, plus being risk on when the market is actually going, going higher. So these are custom strategies just for Chaplin. Um, to summarize what we just saw, uh, in the back test, you can see that we've had significantly higher performance than the benchmark, the market in the S&P 500, uh, at much lower volatility. And I can go through all the technical numbers here, but I won't. But in general, the sharp ratio, the risk to return is much higher. You have relatively low correlation with the S&P, low beta, and you have relatively low drawdown. So these strategies are superior um, based on this back test compared to what the S&P did. Um, and the university TFs, if, if, again, just to... Um, uh, to review, it, this is a unique universe of 90 ETFs that, that Ed and I, we, we decided on what, what really should go in here. So you have a very, you, you have some exposure to things that could be very specific. For example, you have things like Robo, Global Robotics and Automation Index ETF. So you do have some specific sectors, but in general, these are very broad indices. So you have kind of a, a way for the AI to figure out where it wants to invest in any one of these different risk strategies. I think that's that's what we have for now. If uh, and we can give, are there any more questions? We can actually, uh, if there are more, we can answer them at this point. Yes, there is. Uh, with the level of trading activity, have you modeled any tax rate impacts on performance of the various plans? Also, how should we think about randomization of timing on portfolio refreshes? Is it real time or on a calendar? Okay, good. I'll start with the second one first. So the, um, the, the timing is, the rebalance is done on a Monday. So Bela is run over the weekend. It provides a signal um, and, the, and the portfolios. And then on that coming Monday is when the portfolios are rebalanced. Okay. So at the highest frequency this could ever happen is, is you know, once a week, right? If you have a signal to go risk on and then the following week you get a risk off, then theoretically you could have a position for one week. Typically, as you saw, that doesn't happen. Usually the holding period is four weeks. Um, but sometimes it's shorter if, if you if you happen to have a signal that indicates, hey, we need to change our posture, either risk, you know, either going from being risk on to risk off or risk off to risk off on. So those kind of things do happen once in a while, but generally it's every four weeks. So given that, that we're trading every four weeks on average, that means that there are short-term capital gains. And that means that if um uh, uh if if you look at the strategies, they will and, and they perform well then you'll have profits, which will probably uh, get taxed as short-term capital uh, uh, gain tax and not long-term capital gains. And given that we have in specific, every person has their own uh, individual situation. So we haven't specifically modeled here or showed it here. In general, these strategies would do better in a qualified account, meaning an account that doesn't, that's uh, where the gains are tax deferred um, and are not taxed on an annual basis. Clearly that, that's the strategy, but that's also true for any alternative investment, whether it's a hedge fund or, or private equity or anything like that. So um, so that is that is the case. So yeah, if you're able to do these strategies from qualified accounts, like a, a, 
like a 401k or, or an IRA, that, that's obviously the preferable place to put it from a tax perspective, but it would work in any account, obviously. Right. And for the person that asked that question, I'll make sure you have some short-term capital losses to offset those gains. Um, <laughs> um, and, and then the other question is, why Mondays? Um, you know, we tried uh, different days of the week just to see if it makes a difference. And there was no significant difference if you did this rebalance on a Monday or Friday or any other day of the week. So just for simplicity, we thought of a Monday. Obviously, if Monday is a holiday like we just had with Martin the King Day and markets are open, we do it the next day. So it would be a Tuesday at that specific week. But that just, uh, it just was the easier uh, way to do it. Also, um, you know, it's it's two days weekend. So it has more time to run if it needs more 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 time. But in general, that's the reason we've done it. There was no difference. It just made it easier to do it on a Monday. Great. Well, Tal, I really appreciate you, you're a wonderful man, um, very knowledgeable, and anybody who participates in this with us is going to be really enriched by your knowledge, and um, and I really appreciate you doing this for us. So thank you. My pleasure, Ed. My pleasure, Ed. It's, uh, it's fun working with you. And if there are any more questions, please send them my way. I'd be happy to answer them via email um, and, and continue to provide, providing support. So Looking forward to uh, having strategies uh, launched successfully, and um, and uh, anyway, wishing everyone a happy new year. Let me know if uh, if you have any other questions or any concerns. So we'll talk soon. Great, thank you, Tal. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.